Happy Monday, USA Swimming community. I'm Kenyon Robinson, the Director of Sports Medicine and Science for USA Swimming, and someone that has been working with swimmers of, of all age groups from 10 year olds all the way up to Olympians postgrads for well over 15 years. Today I have the opportunity, thanks to our partners at Cho uh, Chocolate Milk, to, to answer some questions regarding dry land and just the activity at home for our membership uh, during this uh, COVID-19 period. Questions that everybody has been, been uh, asking at USA Swimming in terms of, okay, now we don't have access to a pool. Now we're told we can't go to a gym. Going to parks and playgrounds is, is, is frowned upon, especially if, if masses get, get uh, more and more people start to go there. So, so what are we to do to maintain some level of fitness? And, and I think more importantly um, for our larger uh, membership community is, is how do we keep the swimmers engaged and still loving the sport of swimming? How do we as parents continue to facilitate that love and, and of, of the sport and let our kids know that you know eventually this will pass and, and those boxes of waters will open back up and we want you to get back in and have the same excitement and enthusiasm and passion for it that you had before this all started in, in mid-March. Uh, so hopefully after this morning, I'll, I'll be able to, to provide some insight on, on what we can do. The first one is from Michael Lawrence on Facebook. Uh, and he's asking, generally speaking, what is the best sequencing for virtual dry land? For example, warm up, cardio, abs, strength. How would you change your sequencing over time? Thanks a lot for the question, Michael. I hope everything's going well up in uh, the Windy City, up in Chicago. Uh, it sounds like your, your club, your program, like many have already kind of adopted some sort of virtual dry land entity and some, uh, some maybe disc. Um, so here's what I would say. Um, again, trying to, to stick to the original plan uh, that you had before COVID-19 sat in is, is uh, quite simply, maybe you start with some sort of foam rolling to kind of get that tissue quality uh, in check. Uh, rolling out some of those knots. This is a wonderful opportunity for, for every swimmer to start enhancing their tissue quality because they're not swimming and training as much. So start with a nice little foam roller, maybe hit that for five minutes. Then you go into some sort of static stretch. Everybody, every swimmer's kind of got their routine. Um, you wanna get your hip internal, external rotators. You wanna get your hip uh, ab and adductors. So that's your groin and the outside of your hips. You wanna get your hamstring. You want to hit some thoracic uh, extension on that foam roller, and then you want to roll out and do some stretch of, of your lats. Again, you can do that for five minutes. Then uh, you can kind of hit your mobility, your dynamic warm up. Again, um, I do think this is a, a situation in a scenario where dynamic warm up provides a great deal of value. One, it uh, we're, 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 we we don't have the opportunity to warm up dynamically. In the water, which I'm a big uh, a big believer in, that's how you how you warm up for the swim set. We don't have swimming right now, so a dynamic warm up is a is a great adjunct to that. And again, it's an easy way to sneak in some of the basic fundamental movement patterns. Uh, again, like I said, some crawling, some single leg balance while while moving, um, some some uh, single leg balance with the opposite reach balance to kind of get. Uh, not only uh, dynamically warmed up, um, get some of that tissue mobilized, but also work on uh, balance coordination, uh, vestibular system in your, in your younger athletes. And then you kind of can hit your, your power. So, so maybe you're doing some squat jumps, three sets of five of squat jumps, and then maybe you're doing some lateral bounds in which you're really trying to encourage the athletes to really stick the lateral. So jumping on one leg from side to side where they're really sticking the landing and they're not falling over to the right or their knees not caving in. And again, you can hit that for three sets of three. So there's your two power exercises and you kind of get in your meat potatoes of your of your, your workout. So um, kind of back to the example I gave you, maybe you're gonna hit your Tuesday, so you're gonna do your hip hinge, uh, your unilateral upper body pull, and then your uh, isometric uh, split squat. Boom, you're done with that. And then you kind of hit some sort of cardio and I, I think that we're gonna we're gonna hit on that and uh, I think it's been one of the most asked questions and so we're gonna kind of hit on that later and that's Michael hopefully that kind of answers your question of how you would kind of sequence it uh, the second question came from Connor underscore Lewis 13 on the on the Instagram and uh, 
what workouts can we do at home that work the most swim specific muscles? Okay, that's a, that's a great question and I, I think I know what you're asking. Um, typically, I'm not a big proponent of um, doing butterfly specific uh, dry land or, or um, uh, freestyle specific dry, dry land. You know, you wanna get good at freestyle, you swim the freestyle, but I think what you're asking is how can I enhance those areas of my body that typically um, kind of give us aches and pains. And you know, what are those? Those are your, are your, are your shoulders, your hips and knees, kind of one and the same, and then your low back. And so this is a perfect time um, to, to really own in on those things that, um, you know, you, you go see a physical therapist, an athletic trainer, maybe your strength coach, maybe your primary care physician. You say, hey, I'm having some shoulder problems. And they say, yeah, take two days off and then start doing some, some shoulder rehab. And the pain starts to go away. You start swimming again. You're like, ah, shoulder stuff don't matter, but everything matters. Uh, you know, if someone's kind of part of your, your team and they recommend something that matters, uh, a couple things that I recommend for the for shoulder health is there's a, a wonderful, uh, we call it the Edelman uh, routine. George Edelman is a physical therapist out of Delaware. He and his wife, Julie, both physical therapists, uh, both swimmers. Julie uh, is, a, is a proud alumni of the University of Florida, swam for, for Greg Troy. Um, they've been traveling with USA Swimming for, for well over 15 years on the medical staff, and they put out a, a great shoulder routine. I believe it's on our website. Um, and I know for a fact, if you Google the uh, Edelman shoulder, Swimming Shoulder Protocol, great exercises, I would totally recommend and encourage you to do that. Uh, and the second series of, of shoulder exercises uh, comes out of the University of Kentucky. Um, Dr. Dr. Kibler and Dr. Yule have an eccentric protocol um, for the four rotator cuff tendons uh, of the shoulder. Um, I believe on YouTube, those are posted. If not, um, we'll try and get some videos up on, on, on uh, Instagram or, or something on our webpage to get, because uh, we've, we've definitely had some of our national team athletes uh, recommended to do those. Uh, when we drop down to, to the hip and the knee, um, the, the first and foremost uh, kind of hip and, and knee uh, swimming specific or, or at least um, tissue movement movement pattern uh, exercise routine that I could recommend would be the Copenhagen hip routine. Um, that I know is, a, um, you just Google the Copenhagen hip routine and there's a great, I think it's actually now a YouTube channel, uh, teaching you kind of go through each one of the different exercises. I uh, highly recommend uh, any swimmer of any age start doing that. It's gonna uh, really increase your, 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 your hip strength, your hip stability, your hip uh, range of motion, and that's just gonna make your knees uh, um, be in the clear from, from, from knee pain. And then from a low back perspective, um, I would say that uh, uh, I would highly recommend everybody Googling uh, Stuart McGill's uh, four back exercises. It's a, it's, a, it's a side plank, it's a bird dog. Uh, it's a particular way that he likes to teach the crunch, and it's just gonna really increase uh, back health. Um, so those are three ways, uh, Connor underscore Lewis 13. They're maybe not swim specific, but they are swim health specific that I would totally recommend you guys doing. The third question is from Camille Gibson on Instagram. Is running a good substitute for cardio aspect of swimming? Uh, yes and no. Um, so absolutely, anything that gets your heart rate up for a sustained period of time is cardiovascular work, and so running does do that, running and jogging does that. So uh, in lieu of no gyms um, and no pools, running seems like a very, very logical option. Um, I'm very, uh, I wanna kind of put a disclaimer out to, to, to swimmers out there that if you haven't been previously running before this, take it very, very slow. Um, I'm actually kind of advocating for, for riding your bicycle uh, around the, the neighborhood, around parks as my, would be my top priority. In the absence of swimming, um, that would be my cardiovascular choice of, of exercise. Um, I think running and rowing require, um, require you to be able to, to proficiently do that. Now that being said is perhaps you haven't been running in a long time. Um, and, and you need some way to kind of get your heart rate up. 
Uh, maybe you kind of can, can, can break down uh, running into kind of a, a, a five day split in which you're not going out for a two, three, four, five mile run for the first time in, in three years and run the risk of having shin splints, um, hip dysplasia, have some sort of tendinopathy that then once the pool's open, you're gonna be limited from the activity there. And so maybe Monday you start working on running technique or running mechanics. And so you may go 10 meters in which you're, you're really working on keeping your torso really tall as you're sprinting, jogging, running through for 10 meters. And then maybe you go another 10 meters in which you're doing some elbow drive in which you're really driving your elbows back and getting them connected uh, with your lower legs. And then you finally finish up with a 10 meter high knee drive where you're really working on sprinting and bring your knees up past 90, point your toes front, front ahead. This is also a wonderful time you can work on some of your A skips. Um, you can YouTube that. I'm sure Charlie Francis has videos out there of, of, uh, of doing A skips and then maybe going to a half kneeling position and working on arm swings so that we understand it's, it's, it's crazy that, uh, you know, swimming is a, is a bipedal. So you're using both your arms and your legs at the same time to swim. But then when you get them on land, like the, the arms don't move and, and they move inside to side. So you're kind of a windmill instead of a piston, which is, you know, what you want to be for running. Um, so Monday can be your technique day. So you're not going to really get uh, that long sustained aerobic development, but you're going to keep yourself safe because you're working on the, on the technique. And then Tuesday, maybe you go into some sprints and, and um, looking at something like perhaps, uh, again, you know, 10, uh, 40 to 60 meter dash with, uh, and then you kind of walk or jog another 60 meters and start again. Um, that's going to be a good way to get your heart rate up. Again, um, take it very, very low in terms of the number of times you're doing it the first week and then just add a little bit um, each time. And then Wednesday, you can start working on some of that aerobic development with some tempo runs. And again, like maybe six to eight reps of a 300 meter run um, and you're not sprinting, and you're not jogging, you're kind of right in between and you kind of do those on two minute intervals. And then you go six to eight reps on uh, 200 meters, uh, six to eight reps of a 200 meter run, again, on two minutes. And then eight reps of 150 meter runs on 90 seconds. Um, so those are just a good way to kind of get some of that aerobic development, but we're keeping the load and the volume down substantially here, kind of week one, week two, and then systematically kind of build back up to it. Thursday, you regroup and do your technique work again on Thursday. And then Friday, you can finish off with some tempo runs again to get some nice cardiovascular activity. Um, so like I said, hopefully that kind of structures running a little bit more, uh, keeping us in a little bit more safe environment. But uh, if I had my choice, um, get out there and, and, and get on those bikes. Question from Patrick Rivard on Facebook. At what age do dry lands become an essential part of the training process? What's well, an excellent question, Patrick Rivard, intelligent man there. Um, and I would say that dry land is an essential part of the program as soon as swimming becomes an essential part of this, of this young athlete's um, choice of, of, of sport participation. Here's what I kind of mean by that. You know, North Baltimore, we kind of had four, four grooves, um, uh, discovery, imagination, um, uh, challenge, and high performance. And, and so the discovery and imagination are the little kids, the 10-year-olds, kind of up to 14-year-olds. And so let's say that they were practicing six days a week uh, for an hour at a time when they first started off. Well, we would do some sort of, again, kind of basic, what would look like physical education routines for 10 minutes twice a week. You don't need to do any more than that. One of the big things that I champion coaches and programs when they're starting to look at and audit their, their dry lane, their strength and conditioning program is look at how much they're swimming and at the most elite level, right? So most programs like North Baltimore would go an hour and 45 minutes worth of swimming. Sometimes we'd get two hours. Very rarely, we wouldn't do two hours of, of, of dry land. It wouldn't be one-to-one -one ratio. We go, well, I, I know on average it'd be 45 to 48 minutes would be our dry land session. And so just kind of doing those types of, um, you know, kind of ratios and how much we would do it during the week. We would go five days a week for our, for our senior high level group. Um, we'd go three to four times a week for the group below that. We'd go two to three times a week for the group below that, and then uh, one to two, two days a week for the group, um, for our starting group. But again, we, we reduce the time and the frequency of how they're doing it. 
And again, the purpose should always parallel the why we're doing it. The why should always kind of parallel the why of what we're doing in the water, right? So when they were first starting to swim, you know, Tom's, Tom Himes was teaching them, one, hey, how to line up behind the starting block and then how to get into the lane and learn how to swim five or 10 second back. Well, in dry land, we wanna learn how to get them into uh, you know, single file lines, make sure that they understand personal space um, and, and how to move um, without bumping into other people. Then they were teaching them the four strokes. So again, we wanna teach them the, the, the basic, uh, what we call physical literacy. So the, the vernacular that I'll use from the time they're 10 all the way up to their 18, well, we had kids past 18 that would come back and train with us. So when they would come in and, and I would say, um, all right, we're gonna go rear foot elevated split squats, like they understood, okay, rear foot, where, where's the rear foot? Uh, it's elevated, what does that mean? And a split squat, what does that mean? So, you know, with the little kids, we gotta teach them like front, back, side to side, uh, rear, diagonal, all the different uh, movement patterns and, and planes. Um, and that's and that kind of creates your, your um, um, the way you're, you're gonna speak all the way throughout. So uh, kind of a long-winded uh, way of answering when it becomes an essential part of the process. You know, once swimming becomes essential, I think dry land is, is essential as well. Fifth question comes from Shavas underscore 1907 underscore, I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher this, you're, you're Lurgren on Instagram. What is your favorite body weight workout for swimming strength and endurance? So, um, boom, I'll answer the end of that question, strength and endurance. So strength, we're probably gonna be looking at working into a rep range of, of six to 10 uh, reps for about three to four sets for endurance. We're doing anything over 15 for endurance. Uh, I like the one by 20 program. Uh, Dr. Yeses, again, it's something you guys uh, can, can Google, but it's a great endurance um, body endurance program. Uh, in terms of body weight, uh, I think I've kind of already touched on it, but you know, I wanna make sure that there's a squat pattern, a hip hinging pattern, uh, a push and a pull from the upper body, and a loaded carry and some sort of plank, and I think we'll be good to go. Uh, question six from B.Joyful on Instagram. If you typically swim for two hour practices, how much cardio strength training should we be doing on land? Um, I think I kind of answered that uh, uh, a couple questions ago about um, when it becomes essential. And so if you're swimming for two hours, then I ask the question, why do we need more cardio? I mean, if you can't, if you can't enhance your aerobic, your anaerobic and your glycolytic system in two hours worth of swimming, um, I got no answers for you. So, so maybe like the cardio we can scratch out in terms of the dry land activity. Um, but from a strength training perspective, like I said, I think for, for post-grad, Olympic level, college athletes, um, and even your, your senior level high school swimmers, no more than 45 to, to 50 minutes. You can get everything you need to get done. Um, in 50 minutes dispersed over three days and some, some places still like to go uh, five and six days. You, you can get everything accomplished in that amount of time without overreaching or um, what I call garbage yardage on land. Um, and then you kind of work your way down, um, looking at 30 minutes for your 13 to 15 year olds, um, 20 minutes for your, for your 11 to 13 year olds. And then like I said, 10, two, twice a week, 10 minutes for your, for your kids that are just starting off. Barton4 on Instagram, how do your pro Olympic swimmers stay fit at home? Well, uh, I've got a almost six and an almost three year old, so they're not in the Olympics yet. Um, they're staying fit in a different way, but I think you wanna know is how, how, how's Team USA staying fit? And um, I like the way you said at home, because I think most of our athletes are doing a good job of, of social distancing and, social, and um, and self-isolation right now. And so they're looking for things to do at home um, for the, the half a dozen or so athletes that, that fall into that court category that I'm still programming for. The nice thing is that, is like I said, we're sticking to the plan. And so uh, my typical weekly cycle, it's big squat Monday or Tuesday, depending on a Tuesday, Thursday, or Monday, Wednesday, Friday split, but it's big squat Tuesday. So we're still doing some sort of uh, squat pattern on uh, the first, first lift of the week. And some of them still have access to a weight room because they, they purchased weight equipment back in January and built it in their garage. 
some have purchased it, were quick to, to purchase on Amazon, and whether it's just a 45 pound uh, kettlebell or even uh, kind of the resistant, resistance bands. And so given what they have, then, then I'll modify uh, intensity, uh, so, so what they're loading up, frequency, so how often they're doing it, or density, so the work to rest ratio, just to facilitate that pattern. Um, and then uh, working on jumps, uh, as long as you've got a, a little bit of space, you can jump straight up and down. Um, if you've got even more space, you can do your, 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 your jumps out, uh, out and back and just kind of stick to the same routine. Um, I think all of them are being mindful of, of still trying to keep into a nice routine. And so, um, you know, I think they do something in the morning uh, to kind of get their brain stimulated. So whether that's kind of going out for a walk, uh, again, maybe go out and ride a bike, uh, some that, that, that have run in the past you can still run, they're gonna go out and go for a run, and then they'll come back, uh, have a meal, um, take a nap, uh, if they're still taking classes, do some classes online, uh, and then in the afternoon, again, staying under the routine of doing something, that's maybe where they, they hit their, their weight room, their dry land session, come back, refuel, get a good night's sleep. They don't have to get up at 6 a.m. anymore. Uh, so they're getting more sleep. So just kind of staying in that routine um, and uh, sticking to the, to the plan we had written out before. And the final question is from Roel Rademacher on Facebook. When we are able to get back into the pool, how can you combine swimming and strength training um, and being able to recover the next day? That's, that's an excellent question. So I'm interpreting that, that uh, perhaps you you weren't using strength training as much as you were just swimming. Now you've incorporated strength training because you can't swim. Now how do we merge the two of them together so that you're able to recover for the next day? Um, you know, my, my first, that's a great question. Um, I think it, it kind of parallels a question that I get often is, you know, should you lift before you swim or should you, or vice versa? So I think if you're just starting out, you're gonna to wanna to do all your strength training dry land after uh, your swim practice, right? You're, you're, you're on the swim team to be a really good swimmer, not to, be, not to be a really, really good deadlifter. You'll join the powerlifting team if you wanna do that. Um, so you'll do your dry land, your strength training after. So that's gonna allow you to at least get you know, somewhere between six to 12 hours of rest and recovery from the swim, weight session to your next swim practice. So you can slowly add in exercises, how long you go, um, the, the weight you use on the bar, the, the dumbbell, the kettlebell, whatever you're gonna use. You're gonna be able to slowly add that in to, to realize how much it makes your body sore as you're swimming. Um, so I would say uh, if you're merging these two for the very first time, um, I'd probably do uh, start with two uh, dry land weight weight sessions. You know, maybe one on Tuesday, one on Saturday. So you kind of get one midweek, and then one on Saturday after your last Saturday morning practice. Get in, do your dry land, boom, hit it. That way you have Sunday to recover. Uh, if you're swimming seven days a week, maybe maybe you hit it uh, again. You hit it on on Saturday, so you kind of get Sunday to swim it off and get you started for the the new week. Uh, the other, the other big thing, and, and it's kind of why the uh, over, over, overarching theme of um, sticking to your plan. So the plan may have been involving dumbbells and barbells, and now you're just using body weight, but the movements remain the same. Uh, when you start adding these things back in for the very first time into a swim program, same thing. Um, just because you've been doing a lot of great home ac activities um, doesn't mean like, as soon as you get access to, to a bar, get up under a bar, put two wheels on your back and, and see how you feel the next day swimming. Um, take it slow. Uh, the great thing about, much like swimming, the great thing about the, the, the sport, the art of weightlifting is you got time. Um, and you slow cook the process, um, you'll get great the movement patterns, you'll reduce the risk of, of injuring yourself by, by going too fast. Um, and you also reduce the risk of hating or disliking dry land weight training as a swimmer. You know, that's one of the things that, that uh, you know, I had to learn the hard way and now I'm very, very conscientious of is that um, swimmers start to, 
to grow a distaste for because they're so sore or their brain's so fried because they did a, a multi-joint triple extension activity and, uh, and so like their brain's cooked and, and they just can't feel their stroke or their techniques off because the weightlifting is robbing Peter to pay Paul. So uh, take your time, slow cook it when it comes to land-based activities um, and you'll be fine when you start to com combine that. Man, those are some great questions and I'm sure the community has, has many others. Um, I guess in closing, I'll say uh, big takeaways. One, come on, let's let's be let's be the great sport that we are, and, and great uh, athletes out in front in terms of the uh, social isolation um, and social distancing. That's first and foremost. Number two, um, when you're looking to ad adapt some sort of uh, conditioning or dry land weight program, now that you're kind of stuck in your room. Um, Try and stick to the things that you were doing prior to the shutdown. Um, uh, just because you throw up doesn't mean it makes the workout great. Uh, just because you look good on Instagram doesn't mean it's it's the right activity for you. Take it slow. Master the basics ruthlessly uh, to keep yourself safe. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best. I wish everybody great health. And um, hopefully USA Swimming can continue to help, help you guys out.